Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy, and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbacher.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy show. And today we have another incredible guest, man. I just love having people on uh, the show from all different areas, all walks of life, all different locations, uh, because especially now we get to hear a little bit of how they actually survived and and thrived through one of the the world's biggest global um, shutdowns that, that many people have experienced in their lifetime, if not all people. So today's guest is Peter Lehrman, and he's the founder and CEO of Axel, uh, I'm going to have to defer to you how, how to say this properly, um, <laughs> an online platform trusted by thousands of business owners and their advisors to raise growth capital, explore, explore acquisitions, and exit their businesses. So one of, the, one of the things that we see on this show often is um, people have these dreams and they, they build something that they're really proud of, but sometimes they don't want to be in there forever. It's like uh, I have some I've been back, uh, interviewed some people and say, hey, what's your legacy? And they say, which one? You know, I'm 60 years old and I've had seven careers already. I've built seven companies, exited. And uh, part of starting out with the right intention is knowing how to exit and how to, how to grow at the right pace. So I'm super excited to have you on here, Peter. Go ahead and share with us your story about how you got started and where are you from? And what was that one moment where you decided, you know what, I'm going all into myself. I'm not going to let lack of funding, lack of these things hold me back from reaching my goals and my dreams. Yeah, well, thanks so much, obviously, Sam, for having me on the show. I'm really excited to be here and uh, appreciate the opportunity to share my story and hope it's interesting and useful for for your listeners. Uh, I am uh, born and raised in New York City, actually. Um, My mom is a New Yorker, um, and she was determined to raise her kids in New York just the way that she was. So I was born and raised in Manhattan. My dad is from uh, nearby uh, sort of farm country uh, in um, central eastern Pennsylvania. Um, And I'm the fifth of five kids, born and raised in New York City. Um, You know, had a wonderful childhood, got all the opportunities in the world thanks to my parents, great education, ability to go to college without, you know, any student debt, just just so many great gifts and um, that, you know, sort of made my life the way that it is today. I really kind of owe to them. Um, I my father was an entrepreneur, um, and so entrepreneurship was kind of at the table, literally at the dinner table, starting when I was a really young boy. Um, there was really not a lot of conversation about a whole lot else other than business and entrepreneurship. And I think in many ways, I didn't really think that there was a whole lot of other careers out there. I just sort of thought that you know, once you grew up, you figured out. Uh, what business you were going to start and and you started it. Um, So that's kind of how I got introduced to to entrepreneurship. It was sort of the default expectation almost um, in in many ways in my own mind when I think back on my childhood. My brother, one of my older brothers started a company and the company was getting off the ground right as I was graduating from college. So my first chapter um, in professional life after going to college, I went to the University of Virginia um, and my first chapter was actually going and and really just doing whatever it took. I was an unpaid intern, you know, the first intern the company ever had. I would run the lunch orders, make the coffee, and, you know, just try to find ways to be helpful and learn my way around how to be, you know, useful in a professional setting when I was 18, 19 years old. Um, that company um, ended up being an incredible first career chapter. I spent six years at the company. Um, And the company grew to several hundred employees over the course of my tenure there. Uh, The business was based in New York. And the business, uh, to make a long story short, was kind of like um, a matchmaking system for experts um, used by investors um, to to talk to experts in order to make better uh, decisions on which stocks to buy and which stocks to sell uh, in the stock market. Sort of a simple, dumbed-down way of sort of summarizing what the business did is, 
And um, business grew, and I just had an amazing first sort of front row seat into what an entrepreneurial success journey can look like. I wasn't the founder, I wasn't the CEO, but I had this amazing chapter where I was able to watch hundreds of people come and join this company, the business grow, uh, an ability to change you know the lives of others, the ability to create wealth and opportunity for other people. And for me, it was really the first time I really understood like the power of entrepreneurship and the power of the private sector um, to, to be able to like really, really do good. You know, a lot of people think that like nonprofits are the source of good, but I think in many ways, businesses are one of the most powerful platforms for, for good and for, and for the advancement of good things. That really became clear to me when I was there in my first five years, six years. I went back to graduate school and uh, after graduate school, I started Axial. Um, as you were saying in the intro, Axial is a software platform that's trusted by entrepreneurs who are looking to exit their businesses. Um, we provide software-based tools so that entrepreneurs can identify advisors to help them in the sale process. And we also give them free access to data on the most likely buyers for their business and why those buyers are the most likely buyers for their business. Um, so again, oversimplification of what the business does, but um, I started that business about 11 years ago now. And, you know, before we recorded, uh, Sam, you were sort of saying, you know, what was sort of the moment when you decided to really start like living, you know, living your life, you know, for, for yourself? I mean, I think there's been a couple of moments in my life. But what I can say is that building this business was really, really hard in a lot of ways uh, from day one. And I think part of the reason for that was just we, the way we were charging our customers was wrong. Uh, we were charging subscriptions instead of charging success fees. And um, there was a point in 2016, seven years after starting the company. So I've been slogging it out. My team had been working their ass off and slogging it out to continue to build the business as a subscription-based business. And I remember getting ready for board meetings and I had raised some outside capital to help grow the business. And I remember getting ready for board meetings to just sort of thinking to myself, you know, this is just not meant to be a subscription business. It's just not, it's not the, this, none of the customers want it to be that way. And it's just making it just this huge uphill battle. And I felt like <clears throat> because I had told these outside investors that we were going to achieve A, B, C, D, and, you know, and E, um, and I had all these milestones that I couldn't, I couldn't change course. Like I couldn't, I couldn't move us off of that path. And I just had to like keep my head down and keep slogging it out. And, uh, you know, but there were so many signs that that was the wrong way to think about like living my life, building the business in the right way. And roughly speaking at the end of 2016 and in 2017, you know, I, I had, I had dinner with like a mentor of mine who was one of my first bosses. And he said, you know, are you running the business the way that you want to run it? Right. Like, you know, are, you know, are you building the version of the business that you want to build? And I remember just being so pierced by the question because the answer was definitely no. Like I felt like I wanted to run the business in this way and this was the right way to run the business and it would be a happier, healthier business with better employees and happier employees and happier customers. But I definitely felt stuck uh, with the expectations that I had, created with uh, a number of really good outside investors, but I'd created them nonetheless. And it was really shortly after that dinner that I just sort of said, you know, I kind of, I kind of have to, you know, come to the table with this issue and with the, you know, the investors. And so what I did was I said, listen, I really don't believe that we're running the version of the business that is the right version of the business to be built. I don't think we can build a successful business if we continue to run it this way. If you want to continue running the business this way, you, the board, right? Um, then my recommendation is that I help you find a successor um, to run the business, someone other than me, and I'll help you recruit that person. Um, but, but it's not the right version of the business for me to be building. I'm just confident in that. Um, and so I'm happy to step down and help you find that person. But if you want me to continue to run the business, then I really want to completely blow up the business model, the revenue model of the business and make the business organized around only when the customer succeeds, does the, does the business succeed as opposed to charging an upfront subscription. 
And, um, you know, that was a huge turning point for me. It's a huge turning point for my relationship with the board. Uh, a complicated um, period followed that discussion because, we, you know, the board had to sort of figure out what it wanted to do, understandably. And so that took some time. Um, but it ultimately put the business on a path and it put me on a path as the founder of the business where I could really try to execute and build the version of the business that I wanted, the version that felt right to me. And um, once we got the business into a position where we could do that, a lot of things actually started to fall into place. It was kind of like at the point when I was like, listen, I'm ready to walk away from this, right? I'm ready to sort of resign slash be fired. Um, it was once I kind of made peace with that and, and realized that that was sort of, you know, the fork in the road that I was at, it was really shortly after that, that things started to fall into place and the business was able to pursue this different direction. And it was like a strong instinct of mine. I'd been building the wrong version of the business for seven years. And so I really felt confident that this other direction was right. Once I was able to clear a path for the business to, to do that, the customers became healthier, the employees became happier, our relationship with the market became, uh, you know, more productive and constructive. But yeah, it was kind of like a big, you know, it was like a kind of a come to Jesus business moment for me. Um, and, um, you know, that's two years in, in the rear view, uh, rear view mirror now. And, and um, it's really made all the difference in the world. I mean, we've just been able to have a much, much healthier business with a much, much better relationship with our employees and with the customers of the business than we ever were, you know, for the first sort of seven to eight years running the business. Um, so it feels great to have made that decision. It feels great to have sort of, you know, um, stared the, the lion in the eyes and, uh, and made my way to the other side of it. It was really hard for a while, but I'm really happy it happened. Awesome. Now I'm, I'm so grateful that you were able to share that. I literally have a whole page of notes here, um, but I'm excited to ask. I, don't, I hope we get to all of them in the time we've been given, but um, uh, let, let's talk about this because I think a lot of this maybe um, it almost comes down to a moral code of how you think you should grow business, which I, I actually agree. I have other business partners who charge up front for their services, and I just have never really liked charging up front for most things. Um, I prefer to charge on the back end after I've seen the needle move, after I've been able to see success with a client, then I want to do it. The only time I like would charge up front is if I have an actual tangible thing that I'm offering and no, like I already know that it's a, it's a transaction, right? If it's a relationship, then I think that a relationship should be only predicated. Transfer of funds should only happen when the, the success has already occurred. In a transaction of uh, a, a product or something, it's a little bit different uh, because you know it's just a one-time tra transaction, like selling a bottle of water you know you're going to deliver on the bottle of water, so there's no reason why you can't sell it to them beforehand. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah. where does that come from, I'm curious? Like, does it come from your childhood, the way your dad ran business, the way your mom raised you? Where does that moral code come from? You know, I wish I could say, honestly, that it was like a moral code that ultimately was... It just... You know... Um, obviously, you know when you're working like a dog building your own business and, you know, recruiting other people to sort of join in your mission. I mean, you want to feel good about what it is that you're building and, and you want your, you know, one of the ways that you feel good about it is because your customers feel good about it. Right. And, and so I think I probably felt less of like, you know, I think it was less of a moral code that ultimately sort of spurred me you know, to sort of make such an existential decision for the business. And I think it was really more just like seeing that, you know, the customers were just, they were just voting with their feet. They were just like, it was really hard to persuade them to commit to it. You know, their likelihood to renew was not high enough, you know, to build a big scalable business. There were just all these sort of like, all the writing was on the wall that the customers were like, hey, this is not how we want to do business with what your company has to offer. It's not that what your company has to offer is something that I don't care about. In fact, it's something that I very much do care about. I very much am interested in what your company has to offer. I just 
I don't want to do business with you through a subscription model. This is the sale of a business. It's highly speculative. It's way out in the future. It could happen. It may not happen. To your point, Sam, it's not, you're not selling a bottle of water or like some sneakers, you know, on, you know, on the internet. It's a very, very uncertain outcome. And so I don't want to subscribe for like an uncertain outcome. I want to be aligned with you and your company so that if I achieve what I want to achieve, which is a successful transaction for me and for my team and for my business, you guys get rewarded and I get rewarded. And, you know, I just was, you know, we, we got the business off on the subscription based basis. Part of it was just the, you know, my prior career had been inside a subscription business. So I was like, well, let's make this a subscription, but I just didn't, I just didn't think about it well enough. And I just didn't listen to the customers. They were voting with their feet and saying, Hey, this is not the way we want to do business with you. And, you know, it took me seven years to, to really make the, the huge pivot in the business model. But um, honestly, for me, I think it was really more about just having being happier with my job. You know what I mean? Like just not feeling like every day was just going to be such a grind. And when your customers are happier, you can definitely skip to work a lot more of the time, you know? And when your customers are, don't like the way you do business or they don't like the way you charge and your customer support team is dealing with that every day and you're hearing about, it's just like, you know, who, that, that's not as fun of a job, whether you're the CEO, whether you're in customer support, no matter who you are. So I think it was really just, it was really more a customer code than I think it was like a moral code, to be honest. Sure. Yeah, and I think that that's huge. So I do want to go back into childhood, though, and ask you some questions here. So your your mom, you, you mentioned that your mom was committed to raising you in the city. Your dad was from rural-ish PA. I mean, I've, I've been out in Pennsylvania, so I don't know exactly what city he was from, but much west of like Chester Springs or anything like that. It's it's pretty rural. It gets pretty rural. You get into Hershey. Yeah. Hershey's even pretty rural. It's further west than Hershey. Yeah. Yeah. So even further west. So you don't really see another big city until you hit Pittsburgh. I mean, there's not a lot of like development out there. So it's pretty rural. Um, what were the benefits that your mom wanted you to learn in the city? Like, why did she say, oh, I want to raise somebody like, like I was raised in New York? Why was she so committed to that? You know, I mean... I think obviously it'd be great to have her here to answer the question herself. My, my, what I've heard from her is a couple of things. One is, um, you know, she had a great education growing up in New York. And I think that she felt confident that there was just, you know, really, really great, really great schools in New York that she could, you know, try to get, you know, try to, to send her kids to. So I think one of them was education. I think, um, you know, New York is insanely diverse. It's an incra- it's just an unbelievably diverse city. You know, I didn't realize it as a boy, but I mean, all people, all walks of life, all races, all religions, all creeds, that's just standard normal course of business walking around in New York City. It was only when I was like in my 20s and I went over and visited, you know, Seoul and Tokyo and, you know, you know, where where I saw like, these were huge cities with many millions of people in them, but enormously high levels of homogeneity relative to New York, right? Mm -hmm. So I think if you go to Denmark, right, you go to Copenhagen, I mean, everybody is is Danish, right? There's just not a lot of people there that don't have blonde hair and blue eyes. Growing up in New York City, it's just an unbelievably diverse place. So I think you kind of grow up with a really, really just sort of natural understanding for diversity, just as a function of like your first set of surroundings. I think that that was something that, you know, she really, really believed in. Um, And it's just a worldly place. You know, it's a worldly place that has all these different industries in it. You know, I grew up in the eighties in New York, fashion, finance, media, um, you know, just many, many major industries, lots of interesting people, artists, businessmen, lawyers, doctors, the, some of the best, some of the best in the world, you know, live in New York City. And so I think that she just wanted to expose us to the worldliness of it, the diversity of it. Um, and I'm one of five. I love my childhood. A couple of my brothers and sister, I think, had, you know, like one of my brothers loves the outdoors. And so he, I don't think he was as happy in New York City. He lives in Montana now. For me, it was wonderful. I had a great childhood. I loved growing up in New York City. But my brother, John, I mean, he went off to Colorado and Montana as fast as he possibly could, and he's never looked back. So, 
you know, it's a tough place for certain kinds of kids to grow up. For me, it was great. That's interesting. So I'm, I'm a, basically I was really, so I grew up out rural, like farm country in Idaho and then in Grantsville, Utah, maybe six, 16,000 people, like both very small communities. Um, you knew pretty much everybody, you knew where everybody lived. It was very different. And I'm the seventh of 11. And so a lot of my family has still gravitated towards living in those rural areas. And for me, um, up until last year, I was like, hey, get me into a big city as fast as possible. And my family, for the diversity perspective, um, and then 2020 happened with all the rioting and stuff. And then I'm like, well, maybe I don't want to live like in the big city. I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's, there's other risks there. So what other risk growing up that now looking back, you're like, do I, would I really want my kids to go through all of that crap that I went through? Or was there any of that? Was it just like, happy go lucky, you didn't know any different? Well, you know, I grew up in the 80s. New York was starting to turn the corner and improve. I mean, the 70s, I think, were pretty tough and rough in New York. Um, city was really poorly managed at the mayoral level, really, really high deficits, really, really bad stock markets, um, you know, um, a bunch of just challenges, you know, that made New York really quite a depressed place, a lot of crime in the 70s. In the 80s, you know, it was beginning to improve. I mean, we were definitely, I mean, I was definitely mugged a couple of times as a kid walking home from school. But like, you know, mugged was, you know, it wasn't like I got, you know, you know, I didn't get stabbed. I mean, I just kind of got like pushed around and they stole my backpack and, you know, and stole the, my, I was wearing, I still remember I was wearing a Syracuse lacrosse hat. I was a big lacrosse kid um, as growing up. And they stole my hat and stole my backpack and, you know, I had $2 in, you know, snack money that my mom gave me, you know, to go get a snack after sports. Um, yeah. You know, so like stuff like that was kind of normal, you know what I mean? Like it happened, you know, <laughs> it didn't happen every week, but I mean, it definitely happened like every school year, you know? And, um, and then, you know, in the nineties and the two thousands, I think a lot of that stuff like really kind of like went away, like New York became, wealthier, more abundant, um, you know, the mayors that ran the city for like 20 years really improved the, just the crime rates and stuff like that. And so it became an insanely, insanely safe city. Um, and it is definitely regressing a little bit after COVID and everything that COVID has maybe brought on. It's definitely regressing. I mean, like, you know, crime rates and stuff like that are definitely at you know, like 20, 30 year, you know, highs, you know, they're not as high as they were in the eighties and the seventies, but they're way higher than they were just like five, 10, 15 years ago. So, you know, I mean, obviously well, I have four children. I obviously want them all to be safe and to feel comfortable and safe and, you know, not, you know, fear for their lives, you know, just, you know, in the, in the town that they live in. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't mind if, you know, they come into contact with like a little bit of, you know, a little bit of, you know, just urban, urban trouble along the way. You know what I mean? Like, I think that that, you know, as long as they, you know, sort of keep their nose clean and, and uh, you know, and handle themselves well, I don't think anything really severe is going to happen to them. And I think ultimately it's the kind of thing that helps them grow up and have a better appreciation for the world and you know the challenges of the world and the challenges that we have in different parts of our society and poverty and poverty's relationship to crime and all you know this kind of stuff so you know obviously want them to feel safe but i don't want them to live a life that um has them sort of isolated and insulated from some of the challenges that you know the world faces and that the world needs to be able to confront you know yeah no i i agree and that's that, so why I'm asking you because I'm literally about to move down to Mesa, Arizona from Utah. Gotcha. And like that, this is happening Saturday. We're loading our truck. Tuesday, we're well, M Monday, we're driving down. So, I mean, it's happening. And Mesa, even in Mesa, I'm still on the outskirts. I haven't like went city center Phoenix, you know, but yeah. it, it's, it's just going to be interesting because there's like 4 million people in just the Phoenix area compared right. to there's probably less than that in all of. Utah, you know, so it's just a very different, it's going to be a very different environment. I'm excited for it. A little nervous because I haven't, I haven't ever really lived. I didn't grow up in a big city, right? So I've lived in Philadelphia. I've lived in King of Prussia. I've lived in 
these bigger cities, but I've never, I didn't grow up there. So once you become an adult, you kind of have all your, your senses put in. So you avoid certain areas and you can think that way, but as a little kid, you don't really know what to avoid and what not to avoid. Um, but I think yeah. that it is important to get the experience and the diversity so you can just have understanding and more compassion for the people around you and the, the issues that we're facing in our world. I think that's exactly right. I mean, I, I just think, I think when you get exposure to that early on in your life, you have a more natural understanding for some of the world's challenges, right? You know, if you live in a really homogenous uh, environment, it's just, it's harder for you as you get older to like realize that there are all these different lives that are being lived out there and there's all these different upbringings and some people grew up with parents some people grew up without parents some people grew up with a single you know a single parent home some people grew up in areas with really high crime some people felt unsafe to go to there's just all these things and i think you just when you grow up in new york you kind of like it just sort of um it just it's kind of like it's like it's like downloaded on your chip already, you know, like it's kind of like part of what, you know, what's in your chip. By the time you're 15 years old, you've just kind of like, you've picked up on all of that stuff. And so I think the way that you go out into the world and interact with the world, um, you know, you, you have some of those advantages. Um, but, you know, that's not to say that people that grew up, you know, in the middle of nowhere, you know, don't have the ability to be highly functional people and, sure. and, and go out and engage in the world and solve important problems out in the world. I mean, you know, we're all able to figure these things out if we can really care enough about them. And, and, and um, so, yeah, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of different ways you can skin the cat and ultimately have, you know, uh, you know, real meaning and real legacy to, to the life that you live and to the impact that you bring. Sure. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. When you got into your company, first you were with your, your uh, company. If I, if I remember right, your brother had been part of the startup or yeah. in, in some way or another. So yeah. you get in with this company. Talk about the difference between, because um, I think a lot of these things, they, they apply to every area of our life, not just business. I love talking about business because I think it's the one, it's the greatest sport of mankind. It's just the most incredible sport, has so many applications. And it's it's really an effective way in my perspective to discuss life happenings, circumstances of life more than any other sport that I've ever experienced. Like it's just so good at it, but talk about the difference between an entrepreneur versus an intrapreneur. When you get into these kind of startup situations, you grow a company to a hundred, you've got people who are entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, and you got straight up employees, people who just like, they don't want to think about anything past clock in clock out. So talk about the difference between an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur and how you navigated that yourself through this company. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I think, you know, at, at, at that company, um, you know, that business was growing quite quickly. There was real demand for the offerings that that company was, you know, bringing into the market, right? That company, just as a reminder, is a matchmaker for experts with investors, right? So professional investors, like to get information uh, and use information to make better investment decisions. And we at this company would introduce them to experts who could help them have uh, a better understanding of a company, an industry, a market, a topic, et cetera. And we would do that again and again and again and again, literally millions of times a year, right? Helping connect investors with experts on all different range of topics for, for conversations. There was a huge amount of demand for that product and for that offering. There still is. The business is around today and has continued to grow and get bigger. It's over a thousand employees today. Um, and when I was at the company, I was there for six years. And so there were a lot of things that kind of need, there were a lot of initiatives that needed to be developed uh, over the course of my time there. Um, and so, you know, the sort of entrepreneurial experience that I guess I would like to think I had there was. You know, it was twofold. First of all, we set up that business where the experts were organized by their industry vertical, right? So we had experts in healthcare, and we had ex experts in the energy industry, experts in the industrial industry, financial services, tech, and software. And we didn't build all of those industry verticals all at the same time. We would build them sort of one at a time. And so uh, one of the opportunities that I had was to try and help the company figure out how to create a repeatable model for 
building out new industry verticals and new categories? How would we go about finding the experts? How would we acquire the experts? How would we then merchandise those experts to the investment clientele that we serve? So that was sort of one of the big initiatives that I tried to help company was we started out in healthcare and the next category that we focused on was tech. And there were sort of three or four other major industry verticals that we wanted to go in and, and, and penetrate. Um, and I helped them to create a couple of those. The other, um, so those were like entrepreneurial opportunities and the company was very receptive to me uh, helping to you know, pursue and, and to lead some of those initiatives. The other thing is that investors are all around the world. And so we started the company in New York and we served a domestic audience, but the company ultimately had both the aspirations as well as the sort of financial wherewithal to be able to take its offering abroad. So I was able to help a couple of guys, the company, get uh, offices off the ground abroad, overseas, both in Asia as well as in, uh, in Europe, uh, based out of London. And so, you know, when a company is growing really, really fast, you know, there's always these opportunities for you to own initiatives inside that business and, and like really, really, really like create, you know, Cre- it's not an entrepreneurial venture because you're not going out on your own and starting your own business, but there's a lot of white space. When a business is growing quickly and it's meeting you know, the demand from the market, there's a lot of white space for, for employees to go and, and pursue things. And so you know, I got the opportunity to start a couple of vertis- you know, industry verticals. Then I got the opportunity to help start you know, two different offices outside the United States. And um, you know, that was an enormous, those were awesome opportunities for me. I mean, I couldn't have been happier uh, to have those opportunities. I was super satisfied. I had really high employee satisfaction while I was at the company. I was grateful for those opportunities. I think ultimately when I decided I wanted to start my own company, um, you know, that was a separate decision, right? You know, it was like, I really want to feel a greater degree of ownership for the culture of the organization. How does the business, how does the company do business? And I, it's funny, you know, I, I kind of thought I had all the answers to those things before I started Axial, you know, because I'd been at this other company and I felt like this other company had done a lot of things incredibly well, but I felt like there were things that I would have maybe done differently if I'd been CEO. So when I started Axial, I was 30 years old and I was like, I know all the things that I'm going to do differently at Axial. And I went on to make like a ton of new mistakes. It was an incredibly like humbling journey, Um, still is. Um, but it's, it's really interesting. You sort of feel like, you know, over the course of an entrepreneurial journey, like I had uh, at, at my, you know, at GLG, my first company, you kind of feel like, oh, I'm seeing all these things. I get to see the CEO. I get to see what he's doing wrong or what she's doing wrong or what she's doing right. And I'm going to take all of these things from my five years or my 10 years. And then when I go start my own thing, I'm going to have like all the answers. I'm not going to do anything wrong. I'm going to have all of the, the data that I need to go out and execute a flawless journey of my own. And I really felt that way. I remember believing that like, I really, I really had it dialed in and I was really going to like get it all right. And I just, (laughs) I just, I mean, I've loved my 12 years building this company. I wouldn't trade it for anything, but I've made so many mistakes uh, over the course of the, these 12 years. It's really funny to look back and think that I had all the answers. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit more, I think, humble, permanently humble now um, than when I was 28, 29 and and getting ready to start this company. Yeah, I I think it's fascinating um, that it's, this is why I want to talk about this, because this, again, this applies to every area of our life. We're sitting in situations where we think, well, that person could be doing better. I like this. I don't like that. And to be, to be frank, from a leadership perspective, the leader probably doesn't like the same, the same things you don't like. The contrast is there's sometimes that it's the most effective way to get something done, even though nobody likes it. And so sometimes people will try and change it or say, oh, I know better. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to make these mistakes. But then they end up making more mistakes because once you have the weight of like the buck actually does stop with you, you are the one in the hot seat, which you found out later on. You're like, oh, crap, I either have to get rid of my company and say, see ya, or I got to make some changes because I'm not happy, right? I, I've done things that have, made, have not any one decision made you unhappy, probably, but 
assist a, a bunch, a series of decisions over seven years has led you to somewhere where you're just like, geez, this isn't really where I thought I would be or what I wanted. And, exactly. and, and understanding that from a grander life perspective, specifically a legacy perspective, when you start thinking about, okay, this is how I want my legacy to end up. This is how I want to be remembered. You've got to be thinking likelihood is it's not going to turn out the way in your mind, everything works. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of bumps along the road. Um, and then, you're, you're going to either, you know, die in it or exit. And you came up to that decision. I'm curious because you, you went through that thought process of having to renegotiate contracts. And there's a lot of people who get in different types of contracts with their life. Um, and I'm, I'm using the relationship between you and your investors as a contract. I'm sure there was a contract of some sort. Yeah. Uh, even if it was verbal, it's still a verbal contract. Yeah. So you had these expectations that you were going to fulfill certain things and they were going to fulfill certain things. And at some point you became dissatisfied with that. And that can happen in relationships. It can happen with parenting. It can happen with employment. It can happen with your hobbies. It can happen with a lot of different things. What are the steps really to, to really effectively renegotiate that to where it's a win-win for everybody? Because obviously your investors, they wanted to make more money as well. It's not like they were like, no, we want to be poor. They, they want their investment to turn out as well too. So, um, what, what are some of the steps to renegotiate that? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, I think, I think step one is, is really realizing where you are versus, you know, where you are, right? Like really, you can't negotiate yourself to higher ground in a marriage, in business or whatever, with an inaccurate picture of, of, of where you currently are, right? And so I think maybe step one is, and I'm just spitballing here, but I think you know, step one is really not shying away from the reflection, the introspection, uh, uh, an examination of the data or the data points, um, not shying away from that and, and in fact, steering into it, right? You know, running at the fire and sort of running into the fire and just sort of saying like, this is, these are the realities of, you know, of my, of my status quo, my professional status quo, my relationship status quo with my partner or my spouse or whomever, like this is where it is, right? This is what, and so I think in many ways, like just doing that work as opposed to putting your head in the sand and just kind of hoping that the problems are just going to like go away on their own is really, really important. Right. And I'm sure this is taught. I know this is discussed in the context of addiction and addiction treatment. I think it's really true in the context of like just delivering a better, you know, a better long-term outcome for yourself and, you know, your professional life and your personal life is just doing that you know, that honest and rigorous introspection as opposed to just sticking your head in the sand. I think after, you know, you've done that, I think you need to put, put forward your point of view to the stakeholders around you, right? So like in the case, in my case in 2017, you know, sitting down with the stakeholders of the business, right? You know, who had invested in the business alongside me and saying, listen, we all wish with this business, we're just, you know, ripping and tearing and crushing it right now. We all want that, right? Um, but that's not what's happening, right? You know, the business is, is struggling to scale up in certain ways, and it costs too much to acquire customers, and those customers are not sufficiently satisfied to, um, you know, to, to really build a, a, a great, long-term, profitable uh, business relationship with the customer market that we serve, right? And just calling that out. And ultimately for me, it was about saying, and I believe that there's something really structurally wrong with the way that we charge for our services and our product, right? And instead of charging subscriptions, we should be charging if and only if our customers are succeeding. And so it's kind of like, you know, taking stock of where you are, instead of putting your head in the sand, surfacing that with the people, you know, with the stakeholders, whether it's your spouse or whether it's your business partner or your board of directors. And then 
presenting your case for how to make change, right? You know, like saying, this is where I think we are. This is my recommendation for what needs to stay the same and what needs to change. Here's why I have arrived at that recommendation. And um, let's talk about it, right? Like, let's talk about it. Like, let's, let's scrutinize it. Let's pressure test it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you agree. Maybe you agree, but, you know, um, you know, you come to a different conclusion. You know, you agree with my observations, but you think that, you know, something should, should happen differently um, or that we should draw a different conclusion. This is a lot of times, like, I think just a real conversation actually never sees the light of day. Well, you know, again, like just in any context, right? You know, I've been married for 12 years. I have four children, you know, uh, and I've also, you know, been building the business for about 12 years, you know, 12, 13 years, right? And I, there have been times over the last 12 years where I've had higher quality, better conversations with my wife and with my business partners. And there are times when I've had lower quality conversations, right? less effective than but regardless of who your stakeholder is, you know, keeping your head cool, being honest, surfacing the issues, being brave enough to, you know, just like, you know, sort of stare the lion in the eyes and just, you know, ex you know, there's this guy, Ray Dalio, and one of your questions is like, you know, what are two books that have taught you the most about, you know, a topic that you care about? There's a guy named Ray Dalio who has built one of the most successful investment organizations in the world. It's called Bridgewater. And he wrote a book called Principles. And basically, Ray Dalio's book, Principles, is a book about his principles for how he lives his life. And, you know, um, you know one of his principles is accept, you know, you know, accept, you know, accept reality and deal with it, right? You know, you can never make progress if you don't have a clear understanding of reality and you haven't figured out a way to sort of accept it and acknowledge it, uh, you'll never really make progress. You'll just sort of create the illusion of progress for yourself or the illusion of progress for, uh, you know, for those around you. And so it's very, very hard sometimes to accept reality, right? Because sometimes reality is pretty unpleasant. You've done a bad job. You've been a bad spouse. You've made big mistakes with a business and you feel shame because, you think, you know, you just don't want to think that way about yourself. You know what I mean? You don't want to feel like that was you who did that terrible thing, made that bad decision, you know? And, um, and so as a result, you, you know, kind of like stick your head in the sand a lot, but you never really end up making progress on, on, until you've, until you've sort of accepted your reality and embraced it and begin to move forward, realizing that reality is reality. And the only way you can do something about it is to, acknowledge it and embrace it first and foremost. Mm -hmm. yeah, I completely agree. And the one thing that um, I heard you say, but you never said, right. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I want everybody else to like, think about this. You have to be willing to one. Well, let's see, let's even go back. The orientation of going into these conversations are he's looking at it for what's in the best interest of everybody involved. Ego has gone out the window and it's, hey, we're just trying to get this thing to be successful. Let's not get defensive. Let's not, it's nobody's fault. We're not looking for fault or ways to place the blame. We're looking for what we believe the issue is and a way to, to resolve the, the, the potential issue. And so uh, when you drop the ego, it's a lot easier because now you're not no longer negotiating for yourself. And I know for myself, when I had to go, when I have, had to go rene renegotiate contracts with different individuals in my life, mm -hmm. you really have to be willing. You have to get to the point willing uh, emotionally and physically, mentally to be willing to walk away from the table if, if things aren't met, you know, and that's not from a prideful position. Like I know what's best for me, but I just, I, I can't keep doing this because I don't feel in alignment and I'm not saying I'm right. I just know that I can't continue to exist in this space um, operating this way. And so I'd love to be here. And if I can't be here, I'd love to get you somebody else who is willing to, to fulfill this role for you. Um, but I think there's some things that need to change. And that being willing to drop the ego, I think, is one of the hardest things in life in general. 
being yeah. willing to say, look, I don't have to be right. I have no, no uh, commitment to being right. All I know is um, we're not really hitting our objective and we need, to find, we need to have a real discussion about why and what needs to change. And there's yeah. no right or wrong. It's just like, well, and, and I do this with my team, um, slightly, slightly different, but I have my team give me anonymous reviews. So I have them all do an anonymous uh, leadership review of me. And then in front of everybody, I go over all of the, the responses and say, hey, like, I, I'm ready to improve, but clearly what I've been doing isn't working, okay? So, like, <laughs> I'm fine with that. I don't really care if I'm right or wrong. What's a better way to help you feel like I care about your family? What's a better way to, to call you every day, right? Like, it's not something that I think about to call you and support you and, like, care about that. So, I understand my natural limitations of, like, what is. What's a better way to show that to you? Yeah. so that I can grow. And is there a better way that we have like a set time every week that I give you a call, you know, cause I'm a scheduler. So <laughs> like, if that's better, I had a girlfriend once. I was like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to hang out this day to this, like this time every day. And she's like, you can't schedule our, our love. And I was like, well, kind of, we can actually, we yeah. have that ability <laughs> and I got other things to do. You're, you're on there, but there's other things. So it, it is interesting to, to take that approach I'm just curious, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that that was a really interesting final example you shared, right? Where you're sort of, you know, I, I think, first of all, I think it's great that you're, you know, soliciting the feedback and doing it in an anonymous way and then sharing it out with, with your team. Um, and I think, you know, then asking them for uh, ideas on, on, uh, on how you can improve, like what are the specific ways, the concrete ways that you can change your behavior to be more effective? I mean, I think that that's really, really logical, pragmatic ways to improve who you are and what you bring to the table with people that work for you and that work with you or that are part of your life. I do think that some people struggle to, to, to answer those kinds of questions, right? People are nervous to answer those questions. I think sometimes people say, um, you know, sometimes people want you to come up with the answers to that, right? Like they don't want, they don't want you to ask them, what, what can I do better? They want you to do the thinking yourself and to, and to develop good ideas yourself for like what's better, you know, um, as opposed to just ask for, you know, guidance from them. I think. I often find that like, you know, in personal relationships that happens in particular, right? Like, as opposed to saying, Hey, what would you like me to have done differently? You know, it's almost like what they would rather is that I, you know, spend the time myself to think, what could I be doing better? And then just go and do it. Don't ask them for feedback. Just take the time to think deliberately about what it would be like to walk a mile in their shoes and then to act accordingly. Right. So like, you know, I've been, you know, so different people can give you feedback on some of these things. I think sometimes you can figure these things out in like kind of these ruthlessly methodical ways where you schedule feedback and you get, you know, and then I think sometimes in other parts of your life, you kind of need to maybe be a little bit more um, intuitive, you know what I mean? And kind of like, do some of your own critical thinking on what would, uh, you know, it's like, think about it this way, right? Like your mother never wants you, your mother doesn't like want to tell you or remind you to like call her every weekend to say hello, right? Your mom wants you to like, just call her every weekend to just say hi. And she doesn't want to have to like give you feedback to, you know, to, 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 you know, to give her a phone call. Right. It's, it's that kind of thing where some people don't, if they feel like they have to um, tell you what they want, it's almost a sign that you're not thinking enough about them and that you're not prioritizing them enough because, you know, those things would be self-evident. Right. Um, and so that's the one thing I would say that I heard from you just then that I think you have to be careful of because I definitely have a tendency to do the same thing, which is what did I do wrong? How can I fix it? I will incorporate this, you know, effective immediately. Right. Yeah. And in many ways, that's a very, very 
very workmanlike, very effective way to approach continuous personal improvement, right? And I think in certain parts of your life, it works really, really well. I think in other parts of your life, people can feel like it's just a little bit too, oh, to, you know, it's like a little, it's just a little bit too mechanical. You know what I mean? And, and, and it rubs people the wrong way. And I understand that. Yeah. And that uh, one day I will care. Um, <laughs> as of right now, the people who don't like it, they just aren't my friends. Um, I hear you. I hear you. Like, and, that's, and that's fine. Right. Yeah. That's, and that's so a short term decision. I, I recognize where it's like long term. Maybe I wish I would have been different. But yeah. there, at some point it does come down to priorities of like, where does my mental space need to be? Yeah. And when you're building a business, and maybe that's an excuse, maybe I just haven't talked to the right person who can say, oh, you can build a business and be this other way while still being you. I don't know. But it is, it is interesting. It's an interesting thought process. I've never thought of it that way. Um, so I will do my best to, to improve or at least think about it differently. Well, uh, I, think, I think part of it also ties to like how you think about your legacy, right? So like, you know, just to think about things in the terms of like the name of your show, right? So like, if your legacy is largely organized and configured around a business, right, then maybe that, that way of doing things, right, that approach is very well optimized to advancing, you know, your version of your legacy, right? But if your legacy is maybe about the kind of husband you are, the kind of partner that you are, the kind of father you are, the kind of this, then you may have to reconfigure, you know, how you do business and the way that you behave if you want to create a legacy in those aspects of your life. So it's kind of like where your legacy is or where you want to develop your legacy, what you want to be remembered for, what you want to be known for having been really impactful at kind of dictates you know, how you do business, right? How you schedule your life, how you interact with the world around you. Um, and so those two things are kind of pretty tightly, yeah. tightly you know, interlinked. It's, it's a very good point. I spent uh, the last few, I don't know, weeks, uh, my wife and I have been discussing because we really feel like we have a fantastic, amazing relationship and everything's working great. But at times it is very, I mean, it's very businesslike. It's one of the reasons why she married me is because I'm so direct. I, I'm very pragmatic. I think about like, it's very, every, everything's out in the open, right? There's no secrets. There's nothing. It's just, this is what it is. Very unemotional in that respect. So it's one of the great things about our relationship. But um, on, on the other hand, our relationship isn't, there's not a lot of romance in our relationship. And, and we both recognize that. And we both are like, yeah, if it was between romance or a dysfunctional relationship where we didn't communicate clearly, get rid of the romance, let's communicate clearly, right? So we're, we, we understand like that we've chosen what we've chosen, but now it's like, okay, well, how do we add more romance into our, like, how do we go add something into our relationship? Because our relationship is great. When I look around me, and this isn't saying anything bad about anybody else's relationship, but when I try to picture myself in somebody else's relationship, I just think, man, I would not be happy there yeah. like, for all these reasons. But in my relationship, I'm thrilled. And my wife, if she was here, she would say, say the same thing. We both really, really like the way we operate in our relationship. But then like what takes it to the next level from a legacy perspective? How do we like not just take it from a, a functioning relationship, but to like a dynamite, an incredible relationship? So it is a uh, it's something that we're thinking about. And how do we implement being romantic? And that's something I think really does. It comes down to you yeah. have to think of it yourself. Um, you have to like think about what would she want right now? And how could I give that to her or vice versa um, versus, hey, what would you like me to do to be romantic for you today? You know, it exactly. doesn't it just doesn't come off romantic yeah. when you have to say it that way. That's exactly right. It's about anticipating the, the, the other person. Um, and I think that 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 is the next level or that's one version of the next level. But it sounds like you guys have a great foundation from which to build on. And it's something that you guys are exploring together. And in many ways, that's you know, that's, that's ideal. So, I mean, you know, uh, I wouldn't bet against you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's good. I, we didn't get to ask my, my one question that I want to ask. So I'm just going to ask it anyways, even though sure. you're going to have to give like a mega short answer. Um, and then what I really want is for anybody listening who wants the answer to this question to reach out to Peter, because I think this, 
I could, I didn't ask half the questions I want to ask, but this question specifically, I want to make sure you at least get to address a little bit. So when you're helping people exit their business, Mm -hmm. a lot of these people, it's been their baby. They created it. It's their, it's their lifelong dream or whatever. Like this is their baby more so than their children. Unfortunately, like they spend more time with this business than they did their children or their spouse or anything else. Like this is their life. And, and as you mentioned, a lot of these people, their legacy is somewhat tied to their business because that's the identity they they've either chosen by default or intentionally chosen. Um, yep. How do you help them maintain the, the, their legacy, maintain their identity and their legacy and build that up while selling off their baby? Like, how do you manage that from an emotional relationship and, and a continuation of an identity that gets passed on to the generations? Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, we don't necessarily ensure that that, outcome occurs um i think what we try to do is increase the quality of the information that the entrepreneur has at their disposal (laughs) because it's not like there's only one right way to exit your business right in some ways may create you know you may sell your business And you may be able to sell it for way more (coughs) if you're comfortable selling it to anybody, right? But that opens up your business to risk that they fire people or they change the way you do business or they change the product or they change the price. (coughs) But if your legacy is, hey, the number one most important thing for me is if I sell this business, I want everybody who's currently employed by the business to never lose their job. You can contract for that, right? <clears throat> Fewer buyers will agree to that. Um, you may say, I don't want to have any of this. the jobs move offshore. I want manufacturing to stay right here in my town or whatever the case may be, right? And you can contract for that, right? Um, so I think <clears throat> what we try to do at Axial is not say, hey, this is the way to do it. Um, because different entrepreneurs are trying to achieve different things with, you know, the sale of their business. For some, it's their baby. For some, it's their ball and chain, Sam. You know, they're just like, like, I'm just, I'm exhausted. Just get rid of this thing, you know? And they don't, you know, they just, they're at that point where they're just at the end of their rope. And for some, it's like a combination of those two things, right? So I think what Axial tries to do is not say, hey, this is the way to do it. This is how, how, how to think about that. What Axial tries to do is say, there's trade-offs. You're going to get different things based upon how you exit, you know, exit the business, based upon who you exited to, <clears throat> based upon the kind of incentives that they have, um, based upon the reputation that they have. And so we're trying to make that information much more readily available to the entrepreneur. Ultimately, it's just, it's not our business. And so it's not our call. Right. And <clears throat> I've said this so many times, which is as an entrepreneur, when you decide you want to sell your business, at the end of the day, <clears throat> it's going to be you all alone in the arena by yourself. You're just going to have to step up and make a lonely decision. Right. And nobody else can make that decision except for you, not your advisor, not your lawyer, not your accountant, not the investment banker. It's you. Right. At the end of the day, you built it, you own it, it's your call. And it's a super lonely call. I think what we view our role at, at Axial is how can we increase the quality of the information that that entrepreneur is equipped with before they go and make that lonely decision, you know, uh, as opposed to saying, hey, this is the right way to do it. And the truth is that <clears throat> most entrepreneurs really have huge gaps in the information that, uh, that they have access to, huge gaps. The smaller the business, the bigger the gap right? The bigger the business, the smaller the gap, right? If you're trying to sell a big multi-billion dollar business, there's only a small number of buyers that you're really going to entertain conversations with. And it's easy to get information on them. They're big companies, they're big people. You probably have known them for a long time. When you're a small business, you don't have any of that information advantage. You have actually the complete opposite. You have a huge information disadvantage. You don't know whether that buyer is a good person or a bad person. You probably haven't met them. They may not be from your town, you have no ties that bind, um, you don't, you know, and so what we're trying to do is light up all of that information, make it really easily available and accessible to entrepreneurs, and then put them in a position where they can make a better lonely decision. 
Yeah, I love it. So here's the final question. Uh, and that is, if you were to uh, die, you know, and we're six generations from now. So uh, this is your <laughs> great, 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 great grandchildren. They're sitting around the dinner table talking about your life, the impact you had and the legacy you left. What would you want them to be saying about your legacy six generations from now? That's such a good question. Um, I think, <clears throat> you know, I'm trying to, um, you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to do is figure out how to live a life in full. Um, and, and for me, that, that, you know, really sort of revolves around uh, three things. My, uh, my achievements and contributions to the world around me. Um, my achievements and contributions um, and my experiences with my family um, and my like closest friends. Um, and then, you know, just like the, the, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the personal health, uh, my mental health and my physical and my spiritual health that, that I get to experience and enjoy uh, along the way. And so, I would love for there to be um, proof points like six generations from now uh, about how I tried to achieve those three things, you know, um, you know, that were somehow memorialized, whether it was businesses that I had started, businesses that I had helped to support or invest in, um, the nature of my relationship with my wife, and my children. Um, the way in which we decided to, you know, raise them and educate them and the things that we tried to teach them. I would just hope that like, if someone had access to those things, they would say, you know, he really, you know, once he kind of figured things out by the time he was like roughly 30, you know, like 30, 35, like he really started to try and live a life in full where he was focused on giving back into the world that, you know, he had, you know, been, uh, you know, brought into and giving back for a lot of the things that I had been given by my parents, um, giving to the next generation, um, and, uh, and also learning how to enjoy, you know, enjoy my own life, my own mental health, my own physical health uh, along the way. So with Axial, I really hope to build a business that can really help the way entrepreneurs exit their business. If I could build a business that does that for many, many thousands of entrepreneurs, that would be a very fulfilling way to think about a major part of my career, my, you know, my career path, um, you know, with my wife and with my children, I want to have genuine, enduring, permanent, loving relationships with them that can stand the test of time and can withstand mistakes that I will make and mistakes that they will make. Um, and then, you know, for me personally, I want to be mentally and physically um, fit for as long as I possibly can you know, so that I can enjoy the, the life that, that I've been given. Um, so if there are breadcrumbs that sort of reveal those three things, um, then uh, I would feel like I had set an example for, you know, six generations from now that, you know, if they were to sort of follow that example, it wouldn't, you know, take them into the ditch. Yep. Awesome. I love it. Hey, thank you so much. Thank for you. For coming yeah. on. Uh, yeah. Sorry we ran a little bit late, but just love hearing this. And uh, we could definitely have you on again. But if you're listening to this and you want to learn more about his business and how uh, maybe maybe you own a business, you're looking to exit. Maybe you want to start your business, but also start with the end in mind. And like, what does exiting look like? Uh, I think both, both conversations are super, super valuable. So uh, thank you, Peter, for hopping on. And we'll catch you guys next time on the Fuel Your Legacy Show. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Your Legacy.